Hi everyone, here we go again. Um, let's see what we're going to cover today. Uh, we'll start off with the uh, the normal uh, administrative stuff. Uh, my name is Mike Biamonte, uh, FBI School of Operational Medicine. Welcome. Um, thank you again for tuning in or uh, watching these videos. Had a just had a huge uh, huge success with it so far. I'm really I couldn't be more pleased. Uh, guys and girls are watching them, giving me great feedback. So please keep watching. Uh, thank you for the feedback. It's it's very helpful. It uh, motivates me to keep doing these. Uh, a couple of quick things. Let's see. Um, for some of you that are on Career Cert or the old Medic CE, you'll see me start to play around with that a little bit now. Uh, it's an internal F. I shouldn't say it's an internal FBI program. It's not. It's open to everybody. But within the FBI, we have a we have an account, and some of our folks are participating in Career Cert. Uh, those of you that are, you may see me post these same videos on Career Cert because I'm just playing around with a different. Uh, different platform. That's all. So if you're watching this through SharePoint or through this link that I'm providing, it's the same video on Career Cert. So you may not want to waste your time, or it's really up to you. However, you want to skin that cat. Uh, again, no endorsements here. Uh, I'll go ahead and throw the disclaimers out. Nothing classified. Again, nothing sensitive uh, in this video. And our EMT. I've been uploading the hours or CEs for uh, my FBI people into NREMT. Hopefully you've seen that. I kind of goofed on the first one. What I did is I mislabeled, uh, I think it was, I labeled it as AMP2 by accident. And in my brain, I was thinking it was the second video, but I labeled it as AMP2. So I got it all wrong. But anyway, everybody's getting their CEs uh, accordingly. So don't worry about that. That was my goof. I'll get it straight. Um... Again, if you hear my dogs in the background, I'll show a picture of my dogs. Uh, there they are, ferocious beasts. Uh, they are uh, bloodthirsty animals, as you can see. So if you happen to see uh, my dogs, I'll get rid of that picture now. Uh, they're mama's yes, they're mama's babies. My wife in the background. And for those of you that did hear my wife help me in the last video, she was very happy to be able to help. Uh, so hopefully she won't have to bail me out again on this video, but we'll see. Let's see. Let's talk about pathophysiology. This ends up being quite a topic. And this is, an, again, one of my, uh, I get up on my soapbox about this. A&P and pathophysiology at the paramedic level, at the advanced level, if you don't know this inside and out, you're going to struggle as, a, as, a, as an advanced provider. It's advanced stuff. We're going to talk about a lot of cool things in this next 45 minutes, um, but I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, this is for the EMR all the way through paramedic, and it's going to apply to everybody. So if I start going off onto a little bit of an advanced uh, uh, sidebar on some of these things, for my non-advanced folks, just hang in there. I'll come back to midline uh, very shortly, and we'll keep it uh, basic and understandable. So with pathophysiology, it's all about understanding what's going on in our body. Why is fluid moving the way it's moving? Why does a disease affect us the way it does based on the way the body responds. It's just fascinating stuff. It really is. Uh, so we're going to take you down a little bit of that. So let's see. First things first. Uh, let's go back to the cell. So here we are. Here's a picture of our cell. Very straightforward. Um, a lot of things going on in there. We are not going to make you cellular biologists. I am not a cellular biologist. All again I want to talk about here is what the cell needs. All the cell needs to survive. Water, Sugar, oxygen. Keep it simple. In order for the mitochondria to produce ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that's what our body needs. So in the most basic of basic treatments, keep the blood inside the body. That's providing the body, the cells of the body with everything it needs. It's providing it with water, sugar, oxygen. If we happen to have oxygen, uh, and I know on the FBI side of the house, especially in the tactical world, we typically don't carry uh, compressed gas around on our backs. That would, uh, that would be a, a, a tactical faux pas, I would imagine. But that's why in the pre-hospital environment, we try to super-oxygenate our patients. And that's even a touchy subject nowadays with over-oxygenation, free radicals, so on and so forth. So for those of us who aren't carrying O2 on a regular basis, don't think that you're not treating your patient uh, as well as you can. As long as you're maintaining an open airway, 
that patient's going to oxygenate themselves. If they're not breathing properly, you're going to bag them. You're going to give them 21% oxygen. So you're oxygenating them. So the biggest thing to remember about the cell, water, sugar, oxygen. As long as we can keep the blood inside the container, that's the most important thing. So let me get rid of this picture. Well, I'm going to hold on to this picture for a second. So the mitochondria, you'll see the little squiggly lines inside that organelle. That's our mitochondria. Not important in the grand scheme of things as far as what it looks like, but that's the animal we're trying to feed. We're trying to keep the mitochondria perfused so that they can produce adenosine triphosphate energy. Because as we're going to see in some of the topics here today and in the next video, this is part one of two of pathophysiology. So we're going to see how adenosine triphosphate or ATP plays a significant role in everything that we're going to be doing. All right, so we'll pull the video down, or rather the, the, the picture down. And let me see how to, there we go. What we're going to talk about now is fluids and where fluids reside. We're going to talk about intracellular fluids, interstitial fluids, extracellular fluids, intravascular fluid, extravascular fluid. There's a lot of duplication in terms here. So as an example, extracellular fluid, meaning fluid outside of a cell, and interstitial fluid, the fluid in between cells, can almost be thought of as the same thing. And so what's the difference between extravascular or fluid outside of a blood vessel, and interstitial. Well, it's a matter of semantics. It's all kind of the same thing. How is it important to us? Well, later on when we talk about edema and fluid shifting and osmosis and diffusion and the movement of solute and solvent or stuff and water, it'll become important to understand these terms, but I'll, I'll, I'll lead you down that pathway too. So real quick, let's look at the, this picture. Here we're just showing a quick diagram of a blood vessel surrounded by cells that are swimming in fluid. So you'll see intracellular fluid, all right, ICF, the fluid inside of a cell. You'll see the plasma inside of a blood vessel. That can also be considered intravascular fluid. You also see IF, interstitial fluid, which can also be thought of as extracellular fluid or extravascular fluid. It's all just a matter of terminology. What we're really going to talk about here in a little bit is the movement of fluid and stuff. Um, so let me pull this picture down and go on to the next picture here. There we go. So let's talk about diffusion and osmosis. Now, again, we're going to get a little advanced here, but for, the, for those non-advanced folk, it's important to understand uh, what we're doing here because we have to understand how diffusion and osmosis affect hydration. Uh, so if you're a medical operator and you're going to be running a PFT or SWAT selection or any sort of a physical event outside, a mission, manhunt, whatever, and you're forecasting ahead and you're out planning and you're looking at weather and you know, all right, it's going to be 90 degrees with 100% humidity uh, during this next event, well, you have to start prehydrating your folks a good 24 to 48 hours in advance. Understanding osmosis and diffusion will give you a little bit more insight to that. Uh, but on the advanced side of the house, we also look at osmosis and diffusion in fluid selections. What kind of fluids are we going to give patients via IV, uh, so on and so on. So when we talk about diffusion, we're not here to make you biologists. Diffusion is the movement of stuff. Stuff being electrolytes, gases, particulate matter. Think of it as something tangible or something that you can see moving. It's microscopic, you can't see it, but you know what I mean. Um, where osmosis is the movement of water. Keep it simple. Diffusion moves stuff, osmosis moves water. But it's all based on a concentration gradient. All right? Where do we have the higher amount of stuff? So by definition, diffusion is the movement of solute. Solute equals stuff. Solvent equals water. So when we're talking about a concentration gradient, we're talking about a concentration of stuff or solute. So the truest definition of diffusion is the movement of stuff, solute, from an area of higher solute concentration to an area of lower solute concentration. So diffusion moves stuff from a higher area of stuff to a lower area of stuff. 
Simple. Best way for me to think about it, um, when you're making a cup of coffee or you put uh, food coloring into a glass of water or whatever, what ends up happening is you've got a cup of coffee. All right, this is not coffee, but just to give you an idea, all right, my juice, or even juice, right? Take a cup of coffee and you put a little bit of cream in that coffee. Eventually what ends up happening is that cream sort of disperses into that coffee until it becomes what's called homogeneous. Or you have a homogeneous solution, um, which means regardless of where you take a sample from that fluid, you'll have an equal amount of solute and solvent. Solvent is water, solute is stuff, until it becomes homogeneous. Um, gas. Hello? What the? What, what, who's there? What's going on? Whatever's happening here, just knock it off. All right. Flatulence is something that'll kind of resonate with you, all right? If you're sitting in a room, you've got a half a dozen people sitting in there with you and somebody releases some gas. That area around that person is the area of higher methane concentration, right? Or higher solute concentration. Well, the rest of that room is a lower solute concentration. So what does that methane have to do? It has to disperse throughout the room until it's equal, right, or homogeneous all the way through the room, which is why eventually the poor sap on the other side of the room is going to smell what this person did. Filthy, disgusting example, but hey, that's the world I live in. What can I tell you? So here's a quick picture of osmosis and diffusion, and it shows you exactly what we just talked about. Uh, diffusion is that movement of stuff from an area of a higher concentration of stuff to an area of a lower concentration of stuff. You do not need a semi-permeable membrane, i.e. a cell wall or a capillary wall, uh, for diffusion to take place, such as in the case of a cup of coffee or flatulence or whatever you want to call it. Uh, where osmosis is that movement of water. And that movement of water goes from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration. It wants to sort of dilute that higher solute concentration. But with osmosis, you do need a semi-permeable membrane. Again, something like a cell wall or a capillary wall, capillary bed. This is going to be our, our semi-permeable barrier when we talk about fluid shift with edema and that sort of thing. So that's osmosis and diffusion in a nutshell. Uh, we don't want to make it complicated. We don't want to make it crazy. But when we start talking about dehydration and overhydration and fluid shifts, these are the things we're going to talk about. And we're going to reference back to osmosis and diffusion, solute, solvent. Um, and just for uh, uh, clarification and definition purposes, if you take a solute and a solvent and put them together, you have a solution. So as an example, when I take coffee and I pour my creamer into it, I added a solute into the solvent, and now that beautiful cup of, of tan coffee, the perfect color that you want it, is now my final solution. That's really all we're doing. Okay, pull that slide down. And let's see what our next slide is going to be. All right, we talked about osmosis. We talked about diffusion. Any time we talk about moving gases. Uh, Oxygen, carbon dioxide are the two main gases we're going to talk about, especially when we talk about perfusion. And we talk about fluid shift. It's always about a partial pressure. So if I have a higher partial pressure of a gas over here, and I've got a semi-permeable membrane here, and I've got a lower partial pressure of a gas here, well, Mother Nature wants to balance that out. Mother Nature wants a homeostasis. She wants a balance across the board. That's what Mother Nature does. So let's use an OVLI surrounded by OVLR capillaries as an example. So if I have an OVLI full of oxygen and I've got OVLR capillaries around that OVLI, now I take a deep breath in, I have super oxygenated OVLI, a higher partial pressure of oxygen here. But now over here, I have venous ovuli, or venous capillaries, I should say, coming back from the body that are deoxygenated. I have a high concentration of oxygen here, 
low concentration of oxygen here, the partial pressure of that oxygen is going to push this way into the capillary beds. That's diffusion from higher to lower. Now, vice versa, I have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in these alveolar capillaries, because that's the waste product coming back from the body. I have a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli after I take a deep breath in. So the higher concentration of CO2 is here in these capillaries. Lower concentration of CO2 is here in the alveoli. Higher partial pressure is this way. So O2 is going to move this way. CO2 is going to move this way. We exhale. We push out the CO2. We inhale, bring in oxygen, and the whole process starts all over again. But now that oxygen that we uploaded here into these alveolar capillaries, well, they make their way to the rest of the body, all right, via the circulation, cardiovascular system circulation we talked about in the last video. Now, let's say we get to the tip of my toe, which is disturbing thought in and of itself, but we get to the tip of my toe, and the tip of my toe needs oxygen. The capillaries in the tip of my toe are now super oxygenated versus tissue that needs oxygen. Same exact thing is going to happen here, and now it takes that waste product back to the alveoli, and this is what happens in our body every second of every day. It's constant diffusion of, just as an example, O2 and CO2. Well, the fluid shift is going to happen as well. Osmosis is happening at the same time based on our needs, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. So let's see. Different fluids. When we talk about fluids, and here's where um, a lot of our providers, especially within the FBI, um, they want to give IV fluids. And I applaud them for being motivated and wanting to do that. But there's more to it than just sticking a needle in somebody's arm and giving them IV fluids. We have to know what flavor. Uh, when I say flavor, are we giving them a crystalloid solution? If we are giving them a crystalloid solution, is it isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic? There's different flavors of solution that we can give to somebody based on their need. And if we give the incorrect fluid, we can actually hurt somebody. So it's not always as simple as just sticking somebody with an IV and giving them fluids. Uh, there's, there's pros and cons to it. So let's just use that terminology as, a, as an example here for a second. Isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. Three different types of fluid. And when I think tonic, again, my world is all about food and booze. Right? So when I think about a gin and tonic or a tonic water, you pour somebody a glass of tonic water. What's in that glass? A lot of bubbles. Right? There's just a lot, a lot of bubbles. I think of that as tonic, those, those carbon dioxide bubbles. So if I pour a glass of tonic water and I see all those bubbles, can I say that that is a hypertonic solution because there's a lot of bubbles in it? No, because I have nothing to compare it to. So is it hypertonic compared to what? And that's what you have to ask. So if I poured myself a glass of tonic water or seltzer water, a lot of bubbles in it, and I have just a glass of tap water over here, which is considered to be hypertonic, all right? The, the tonic water, the seltzer water. So that's hypertonic compared to this. And that's the way you have to think about osmosis and diffusion when we talk about different types of solution. So as an example, 0.9% uh, normal saline, uh, D5W, um, lactated ringers, those are the three most popular crystalloid solutions that we give somebody pre-hospitally, uh, IV or IO, something that's going into our, to our circulatory system. Those are considered to be isotonic solutions. Isotonic compared to what? Compared to the, com the composition of our blood they're considered to be isotonic. So it's somewhat neutral. So there shouldn't be a huge fluid shifting, if you will. So think of isotonic solutions in comparison to our blood to red blood cells. So take a look at this picture here. And what you're seeing there is a diagram of a red blood cell. And in those three boxes moving from left to right, you have a red blood cell and an isotonic solution. If you notice, the red blood cell is maintaining its shape. There is no fluid movement. There is no um, solute or stuff movement across that cellular membrane. It's neutral. It's isotonic. Nothing's going to move. However, if you put that same red blood cell 
into a hypotonic solution. Again, hypotonic compared to the red blood cell. Well, now what Mother Nature wants to do is she wants to make it homeostatic. She wants to move from an area of lesser solute concentration. Oh, hold on. I just lost my screen here. If I get it back. There I am. Okay, sorry, my computer screen died. I know you didn't see that, but I did. So let me go back to hypotonic. Um, if we put that red blood cell into a hypotonic solution, hypotonic compared to the makeup of the red blood cell, what's going to happen now is that cell is going to start to expand. Remember, it's a semi-permeable membrane, so it's only going to allow certain things out and certain things in. In this case, Mother Nature is forcing fluid in, and it's going from a a lesser solute concentration to a higher solute concentration. Think of it as Mother Nature is trying to dilute that cell and make it similar to its surroundings. Well, the cell can't get rid of everything that's inside of it. So what ends up happening is that cell starts to swell because Mother Nature is forcing water into it. And if it doesn't stop, what will end up happening is that cell is going to lice and die. It's going to burst which is cellular death, which is bad. So in some circumstances, giving somebody a hypotonic solution, um, and as an example, a hypotonic solution is a half normal saline or a quarter normal saline. Those are considered hypotonic solutions. Um, or you can give somebody a hypertonic solution, a 3% saline, 5% saline, uh, D5W, uh, and, uh, and I and um, D, uh, D10W, uh, there's a number of different hypertonic solutions out there. So if you look on the diagram here, if we put that same word blood cell into a hypertonic solution, the fluid is pulled out of that cell and you start to shrink that cell down because the cell, again, has that semi-permeable membrane and solute isn't going to come out, but water is going to move freely back and forth. So depending on what's going on with our patient, um, I'll use intracranial pressure as an example. Let's say we've got fluid on the brain, hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, uh, for, for whatever reason, or if we have intracranial bleeding, and uh, whatever. Theoretically, uh, pre-hospitally, this was played around with for a while, uh, years ago, but we don't do it on a routine basis. Theoretically, if we gave somebody a hypertonic solution, once that solution made it to the brain and it was inside the blood vessel, well, what will end up happening now is Mother Nature would draw fluid off of the brain, off of that brain tissue into the bloodstream because it's trying to balance out, going from a lower solute to higher solute concentration, and it would pull that fluid off the brain. So there are applications to different types of fluids. Let me pull this screen off here. So depending on what's wrong with our patient, it may dictate what fluid we give. Again, pre-hospitally, traditionally, we're using isotonic solutions, which are normal, neutral type of solutions. You know, 0.9% normal saline, D5W, lactate of ringers, sort of neutral. If we have somebody who's dehydrated and desperately in need of volume expansion, well, now these crystalloids pardon me, these isotonic solutions may end up being now more hypotonic compared to the body's dehydrated state. So we end up now hydrating our patient. So it depends on, uh, on the patient's baseline as to how these fluids are going to interact. So for the basic provider, if you see uh, an advanced provider starting an IV, why are we starting the IV? Is, is our patient dehydrated? Are we trying to rehydrate them? Is it just a, a conduit to give medications? Here's a little news flash for you. Crystalloid solutions have never really saved anybody. <laughs> Quite frankly, what we're finding is crystalloid solutions are doing patients harm. Uh, I had a doctor not long ago in a, in a lecture tell me that the only reason that we should be breaking out salt water or 0.9% saline is to boil pasta. That's about the only application for it. That was his opinion. Again, I'm not here to, to dictate policy. 
Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big shift now as to getting away from uh, saline as a, as a, a treatment, if you will, in the pre-hospital world. But, all right, let's move on. Let's talk about the way we move things from point A to point B. And we'll talk a little bit about mediated transport mechanisms. And what I'll, oh, before that, I wanted to show you one thing. I almost forgot. Um, I'm a child deep down at heart. Uh, so those of you who have ever watched the movie Ice Age, uh, the video I'm going to show you here in just a second is Sid. Right? Sid is that disgusting sloth. And he's thirsty and he slides down the ice and he sticks his head in the seawater to get a drink. And he pulls his face out and goes, oh, that's salty. And what ends up happening is he's bringing in this hypertonic solution, right? Seawater. It's hypertonic compared to his body makeup. So what you're seeing in this video, which I think is funny, is all the fluid inside Sid's tissue getting sucked out of his tissue and into his vascular space, and dehydrating him essentially, uh, which is why uh, bartenders, and I was a bartender for years, so this was part of my ploy to get you to drink more, is there was always salty treats on the bar, right? Peanuts, pretzels, whatever. Of course, the more salt you eat, the thirstier you get because you're dehydrating your cells and you drink more. Right? That's the method to the madness. So uh, here's Sid and his, uh, his, uh, his, <laughs> his hypertonic situation. How big is this ocean? Water, water everywhere. Nor any drop to drink. Except maybe that drop. Mmm, that's a little salty. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. I do. I'm a big kid. What can I tell you? All right, here's uh, checking my notes. Let's talk about mediated transport mechanisms real quick. So let's go back now to the cell wall and how fluid moves across a cell wall. Diffusion and osmosis are taking place regularly. We just saw that in the last... Uh, the last picture. Again, diffusion moves stuff from an area of high stuff to an area of low stuff. You do not need a cellular membrane for that or semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis is the movement of water solvent from an area of low stuff to an area of high stuff, but you do need that semi-permeable membrane. A solvent and a solute equal a solution that's osmosis and diffusion. To add to that, we have what are called mediated transport mechanisms. Uh, with mediated transport mechanisms, we have um, facilitated diffusion and active transport. We'll keep it simple. Here now is where ATP starts to come in. There's a method to my madness. So let me show you this picture. What you're seeing here on the left is an example of Diffusion versus facilitated diffusion. And let me just give you the simplest of examples. Um, diffusion we've already discussed. We beat that to death. Now, there are some molecules that cannot cross the cellular barrier or the cell wall because they're too big and they need help. They need a facilitator. So the best example that I know of is glucose. Glucose is a fat molecule. It wants to get into the cell, but because it's sugar, it's fat and it can't get into the cell because none of the openings in that semi-permeable membrane are big enough to allow it to cross. So it needs a facilitator, it needs a helper. And in this scenario, we talk about insulin. Insulin comes along and acts as a facilitator to open up the gate, if you will, to allow glucose to come into the cell. Now this requires no energy. Uh, glucose is going along what's called its concentration gradient. All right, It wants to diffuse into the cell because it's going from a higher concentration to a lower. And what does the mitochondria need? It needs water, sugar, and oxygen. Sugar needs facilitated diffusion. It needs insulin to get it into the cell. So that's the perfect example of facilitated diffusion. Active transport's a little different. Um, under normal conditions, and you have to follow me down the rabbit hole on this one, under normal conditions, there is a higher concentration of potassium inside of a cell versus outside. 
and there is a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than there is inside. Well, that's the way the cellular world likes it, right? The cell likes high potassium inside, high sodium outside, and vice versa. Mother Nature doesn't want that. Mother Nature is tough. Mother Nature wants balance, wants homeostasis. Any of you who are parents know that if you're dishing out ice cream for your kids, if you give one kid one scoop, and one, skid two, one kid two scoops, well, you've got a problem. So everybody's getting two scoops whether they want it or not. That's kind of the way Mother Nature sees it. So she doesn't like higher on one side and lower on the other. So she's trying to balance it out. So what she's trying to do is she's trying to draw potassium into the cell. Uh, strike that. She's trying to draw sodium into the cell and pull potassium out to keep it balanced on both sides. Well, the cell doesn't like that. So what ends up happening is there's a little pump on a cell wall, ironically enough, called a sodium potassium pump. And all this pump does is it pumps sodium out of a cell and pulls potassium back in against the concentration gradient. Again, Mother Nature is actively pulling sodium into the cell and pulling potassium out. And the cell doesn't want that. So this pump is being generated and powered by adenosine triphosphate, ATP, to, act, to actively pull sodium out and pull potassium back in. That's active transport, and that takes energy. So let's take a patient in shock. Let's take a patient who's deoxygenated. Let's take a patient who's, who's desperately trying to die on you, and the cell is not getting oxygen, sugar, water. More specifically, let's say oxygen here as an example. So we're leaving all of our red blood cells on the street. All right, patient shot, stab, trauma, whatever. Now that means less oxygen is getting to the cell. Well, that means less oxygen is getting to the mitochondria, which means now we're slipping into anaerobic metabolism, which we talked about in the last video, which ends up dropping our pH or making us more acidic. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how this affects our body. Um, but what it also does, it affects the mitochondria's ability to generate ATP. So now the body is suffering from a lack of ATP. If the body cannot produce ATP, it cannot fuel the sodium potassium pump on the cell wall. Well, if it can't fuel that pump, well, now sodium rushes into the cell. Well, in the chemistry world, remember the bartender, in the chemistry world, what follows sodium? Water. Think about SID. Think about the, the salty treats on a bar. Well, now what ends up happening is all that fluid rushes into a cell. We saw that red blood cell in that center uh, diagram of that one picture I showed you. Well, now that cell is going to start to swell, and eventually that cell is going to lice and die. Now we have cellular death, and this takes place all over the body. So something as simple as stopping the bleeding, keeping red blood cells in to transport oxygen, keeping someone's airway open so they can get oxygen into their body and making sure that they're oxygenated is going to save cells. And that's all we are. We're nothing but trillions and trillions of cells. So that's our objective. So albeit we're talking about a lot of fancy things right now, it all comes down to the cell, keeping it oxygenated, keeping it hydrated, so on and so on. All right, so let's pull this slide off. All right, good. I don't want to go too hard, too fast. Uh, again, there's a lot of advanced stuff here. Uh, but it all does come back to stopping the bleeding, keeping the airway open, oxygenation, basic stuff. Okay, so let's look at capillaries. And you're thinking to yourself right now, all right, stupid, you talked about capillaries in the last video. Well, I told you, this is you're going to see a lot of repeat themes here because they all play into each other. So we talk about a cell, that semi-permeable membrane, diffusion, osmosis, fluid movement, gas movement, we already beat that to death. Now we're going to talk more about capillary beds. And we alluded to that earlier. We talked about CO2 and O2 moving uh, across that capillary membrane or that capillary wall based on tissue oxygenation. But there's also osmosis taking place. There's also fluid movement going on. Um, and before we talked about acidosis. So the body doesn't get oxygen. 
the body starts to go into anaerobic metabolism. The body starts to produce lactic acid. Our pH drops. Uh, our acid levels start to go up. Our body becomes acidotic. Our body doesn't like that. A lot of bad things happen. 7.35 to 7.45. That's our normal range of, of pH within our body. We'll get more into that in a later video. But if we start to drop and become more acidic, um, a lot of bad things happen in our body. Oxygen can't bind to hemoglobin, so it can't transport properly. We start to have vasodilation uh, all over the body, which ends up affecting our ability to perfuse our cardiac output drops. And we'll talk more about all those equations in a later video. Um, but what also happens at the capillary level, let me go ahead and put this screen up here, this picture up here. What we end up having is leaky capillary syndrome. Because now as our pH starts to drop, our capillary beds or the epithelium, remember we talked about it being like a brick wall. Well, now those bricks start to separate. Whereas now before, only fluid was allowed to, to move through those, those gaps where the, the mortar of a brick wall should be. Well, now those bricks start to pull apart and fluid starts to third space or push out of the capillary beds, which isn't supposed to happen. Um, so think about your body as a container. So now that fluid is oozing out of the container into the interstitial space. It's moving from the intravascular space to the extravascular space, or also called the interstitial space, which is not where we want our fluid. We want our fluid to stay inside of our cardiovascular system. Well, to add insult to injury with acidosis, we have the vasodilation, we have the separating of epithelium, now these cells are pulling apart, but if you look on this picture here, you'll see what are called pre-capillary sphincters. There's also post-capillary sphincters that aren't, um, uh, that aren't listed here. But what ends up happening now at the capillary bed level in periods of acidosis is these pre-capillary sphincters dilate and stay open, whereas the post-capillary sphincters constrict and stay closed. So instead of both of them opening and closing somewhat uh, in sync to allow and facilitate movement through those capillary beds from left to right, from the arterial side to the venous side, what ends up happening now is the pre-capillary sphincter stays open, post-capillary sphincter stays closed, and blood is being pushed into those capillary beds. And the pressure inside of those capillaries starts to increase, and we get what's called a very high hydrostatic pressure. Now, water is non-compressible, so it has to go somewhere. Epithelium are pulling apart because of acidosis. Now we have this high hydrostatic pressure in these capillary beds, which is forcing fluid now out of capillary beds into the interstitial space, overall reducing our cardiovascular volume. And just, we're spiraling out of control now. These are not things that we're going to be able to see in our patient right away. Um, but these are things that are going on in periods of hypoperfusion. So we have to assume that this is going on as somebody is getting shocky. Have you ever gone up to see somebody in an ICU, CCU, whatever, a sick patient uh, in a hospital, and they, they appear to be puffy, swollen? Uh, you know, uh, nurses will take rings off and jewelry off of the patient uh, in anticipation of this. Well, the reason they may be puffy and swollen is they may have been a little shocky, whether they were septic or whatever the case may be. And they were starting to swell because of this third spacing. Uh, so it happens more often than you might think, but you have to you have to look for it. You have to know what to look for. So with edema, and let me pull this slide down. With edema, what we end up having is that fluid shift. So when we are swollen for whatever reason, trauma, medical, doesn't matter, we have that third spacing from capillary beds into the interstitial space, and we start to swell. And this picture here just shows you an example of what we call plus one, plus two, plus three, and plus four pitting edema. So when you come up to someone and you're assessing their edema, you can actually push your finger into their skin, with their approval, of course, or their consent, and the amount of time it takes for that skin to rebound or snap back uh, will dictate how edematous they are. 
Uh, again, people can suffer from edema from a number of different things. Congestive heart failure, renal failure, liver failure, overhydration, uh, congestive heart failure, a number of different things. Um, you see somebody put their shoes and socks on in the morning, and go out the door to do their thing. By the time they get back home, they got cankles, right? Their, an their ankles are all swollen up. They get those deep grooves in their ankle from where the socks are. That's an example of dependent lividity. Uh, so because gravity is pulling that fluid down to their ankles, that could be from a number of different reasons. Who knows why? And usually the treatment is just putting your feet up and letting the lymphatic system do its thing and pull that fluid off of, uh, off of that tissue and trying to overall correct the underlying reason for the edema. But that's beyond the emergency uh, care. We look at edema in the cases of congestive heart failure, uh, pulmonary edema with left-sided heart failure, uh, systemic edema with right-sided heart failure, and even with congestive heart failure. But we'll talk about that in another video. Okay, now we pull that video down. Let's get into the last piece of this, uh, which is water balance and how we, how we do it. It's really pretty, pretty amazing. And again, I'm a little bit of a geek on this stuff, so I find this stuff fascinating, to say the least. And I'm just referencing my notes here to make sure I stay on track. Okay, so what we're going to talk about here briefly, and this is how we're going to end uh, this video, is how we regulate our fluid balance in our body. Within our body, we have receptor sites. We have osmoreceptors, which sense the osmolarity of our blood. Think of it this way. Osmolarity equals thickness. It really doesn't, but this is just an easy way to remember it. So when we have these osmoreceptors all throughout our body, what they're sensing is the thickness of our blood. How hydrated are we, if you will? We also have baroreceptors. Baroreceptors in our larger blood vessels are sensing pressure or volume. So these sensors are going to sense whether we are full or not. What's, what is the pressure of the blood in our cardiovascular system? So osmoreceptors will sense whether we're hydrated or dehydrated. Baroreceptors are going to sense how much blood volume we have. And also remember, water follows sodium. There's a reason for that, remember. So let me put this picture up. So what we're seeing here are osmoreceptors and baroreceptors in the upper left and upper right uh, side of this thing. One of the main regulators of fluid in our body is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So if we, have, if we give somebody a diuretic, Bumex, hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, all right, we're asking them to pee. Uh, that's, a, that's what a diuretic does. If we secrete from the pituitary gland ADH or antidiuretic hormone, well, this is telling our body, don't pee. Don't get rid of fluid because we need it. So if our body, through our osmoreceptors, sense that we are dehydrated, our blood is getting thick. And again, it really isn't, but follow me down that rabbit hole. What happens is that these osmoreceptors tell the pituitary gland, hey, Secrete ADH, antidiuretic hormone, so you don't pee, which is why if you're out PTing, uh, working, training, whatever, and it's warm out, you may be drinking a lot of fluids and you're not peeing a lot. That's Mother Nature holding on to your fluids. And what this does, ADH sends a signal down to your kidneys and tells your kidneys, hey, hold on to salt because water follows salt. So our body is holding on to sodium, albeit you may not think so because when you're sweating, you'll see those white rings around your armpits and your boots and whatnot, but your body is desperately trying to hold on to sodium at the renal level, thereby holding on to water. Well, something else that's happening as you become dehydrated is baroreceptors are sensing that your fluid level is dropping, and that's also going to produce ADH or tell the pituitary gland to kick out more ADH and thereby holding on to sodium and holding on to fluids. Um, something else that happens in the body, which is really uh, wild, is your kidneys play a huge role in this. So if we start to sense and the body starts to sense uh, a low sodium level or a high potassium level, which is typically what happens with dehydration, something called aldosterone. 
uh, is going to be released from the adrenal cortex or the adrenal gland. Well, aldosterone is also going to tell the kidney, hold on to sodium. These are all negative feedback mechanisms. These are all happening at the same time. So if the pituitary gland is secreting ADH because of osmoreceptors and baroreceptors, well, now aldosterone is being secreted from the adrenal cortex or the adrenal gland, and that's telling the kidneys, hey, hold on to sodium. Well, at the same time, the kidneys are secreting something called renin. Renin is being secreted by the kidneys, and renin converts into angiotensin 1, which converts into angiotensin 2, which is a very potent vasoconstrictor, and also tells the body to secrete ADH. As a point of reference, uh, people who suffer from high blood pressure will take an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, ACE-I. These are your Lil drugs, so lisinopril, acupril, captopril. Um, when we have this renin release from our kidneys and we convert from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, this actually happens in the lungs, not important, but that conversion needs an enzyme. Right? And it's this enzyme that converts 1 to 2, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. This is what creates big vasoconstriction and the secretion of ADH. In order to prevent this vasoconstriction, thereby lowering someone's blood pressure by allowing blood vessels to dilate, patients sometimes take an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, and that, can, that inhibits that conversion from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So what I just described in a very, very quick nutshell, I'm going to put a second um, uh, a second picture up here is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This is pretty advanced stuff. So when we talk about the body and how it regulates fluids, it's all about osmoreceptors sensing hydration or dehydration in the blood, the osmolarity of blood. It's all about baroreceptors sensing the volume within our cardiovascular system and how those two sensors and the kidneys play a role in the secretion of ADH, antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland, the secretion of renin from the kidneys, which turns into angiotensin 1, which is converted into angiotensin 2, which provides big vasoconstriction and continues to tell the pituitary gland to secrete ADH. So it's a lot of wild things going on here. Um, it's just to maintain a, a blood pressure. So let me pull this down here and let's put it into perspective for a second. Um, let's look at a woman who's having false labor. Uh, for those of you who have had children or uh, have had significant others who have had children, your significant other or you may have been the one suffering from false labor pains or Braxton Hicks contractions. Some of you may have been told by your OB doc, hey, go drink a gallon of water and go for a walk around the block and those, comp those contractions will go away. Nine times out of 10, you, that person drinks some water and goes for a walk, those go away. What ends up happening is in a woman uh, versus a man who's pregnant, of course, in a woman who's pregnant, if she's dehydrated, well, the pituitary gland is secreting ADH, telling her not to pee. However, what piggybacks onto the back of ADH from the pituitary gland is pitocin or oxytocin. Oxytocin or pitocin from the pituitary gland is what causes uterine contractions uh, for a woman to give birth. So if she's secreting ADH because she's dehydrated and pitocin is also being secreted on the back of it, well, it's going to create uterine contractions. So she drinks a gallon of water, not a gallon, but she drinks a good deal of water. Well, now it suppresses the release of ADH because she's not dehydrated anymore. Therefore, it suppresses the release of oxytocin or pitocin. Therefore, it stops the uterine contractions. Pretty cool how that happens. Now, am I suggesting that every patient you come across that's having Braxton Hicks or you, contractions, you say, ah, just drink some water, you'll be fine. No, I'm not suggesting that. That's just food for... Uh, Food for thought is an example as to why an OB would tell a woman to do that. Just pretty interesting. Okay.
So we covered a good deal of information here. A lot of it was pretty advanced stuff, but at the end of the day, whether you are a basic provider or an advanced provider, it all comes back to the cell. It all comes back to keeping somebody oxygenated, keeping the blood inside the body. So it goes back to that basic mantra of the March exam, stop the bleeding, open the airway, move. Me as an advanced provider, any of the other advanced providers in the room, get away from the idea of, oh, I got to flood this person full of fluids. To That's a, it's a, a controversial uh, concept. Yes, fluids have their place, but now with the understanding, with a better understanding of isotonic, hypertonic, um, hypotonic solutions, crystalloid solutions, and just fluid management in general, uh, a lot of times now what we're looking at is... Uh, IV is more of a maintenance and a conduit just for, for drug administration and flooding somebody with crystalloids isn't really necessarily the best idea. There are some concepts out there of giving people hypertonic solutions, colloid solutions, which are protein-based solutions for volume expansion. That's a whole other topic in and of itself. So I'm not saying that all fluids are bad, uh, but look within your organization, look within your protocol to see how we can best use fluids. And for the basic providers out there, this is just giving you a little bit of an insight as to pathophysiology and how fluid shift and osmosis and diffusion come into our everyday maintenance, homeostasis of our body, uh, regulation of our body. Again, this is fantastic stuff. I love this stuff. I could talk about it all day, but I'm at about the 50 minute mark right now. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank you again for watching. Any comments, please go ahead, throw them my way. Uh, hopefully you'll uh, tune in again for part two of pathophysiology, and then we'll transition into, I think it's pharmacology after patho. I got to check. But again, I hope you're enjoying this. Have a great day. I hope you stay COVID free. And that's about it. Take care. One more thing I almost forgot uh, for my FBI folk. Cell phone is the new uh, password of the, of the day. So cell phone, any, any one of the cell phones you want to carry around with you. So that is your password, cell phone. Have a great day. Take care. Mm -hmm.